The previous example showed why if you have an unstable plant that you should not choose a controller that exactly cancels one of the unstable poles. So you can see here that at S minus 1 we have a pole. Uh, well, the pole will be at S equals 1. And so that's in the right-hand plane, so this system would be unstable. So by choosing some controller that had a 0 at S minus 1, uh, S equals 1, so the 0 would be S minus 1. So in that case, you would be canceling the pole, but then the disturbance could still produce inputs that would make the system grow unbounded. So here, uh, we'd like to be able to look at the root locus and see how we can make the root locus move to the left. So we want the root locus to obey us. So we can use lead compensation to move the root locus left. And in order to do that, after we finish, we're going to check the transfer function to see whether or not we've actually rejected those disturbances such that the system will remain stable. So here's a try. I'm going to choose g of c equal to s plus 2 over s plus 10. So I've sort of arbitrarily chosen s plus 2, and then I've chosen the pole to be 5 times greater than the 0. See, I'm not really drawing this to scale, but you can see that the 0 is at about scale, and then the other pole is way off to the left. And so this root locus is not ex it's not going to head off to infinity, this part of the root locus. It heads from this pole towards the 0. So first I'm going to calculate the breakaway points. So our open loop transfer function is s plus 2 over s plus 10 times 1 over s minus 1, s plus 1. So I'm calculating the breakaway points because I know that I'm going to see some departure here that's going to meet on this side maybe. It might be a departure that's going to head off like this. I'm not 100% sure what it's going to do, but whatever it does, I'm going to want to see how it happens, and I can calculate the breakaway point to tell me exactly what's going to happen. So in order to calculate the breakaway points, I create this function p. And then I multiply through the various pieces of the transfer function so that I can take the derivative of p with respect to s. And I'm going to set that derivative equal to 0. So here's me calculating the derivative, the derivative of a times b minus a times the derivative of b divided by b squared. And then I set it equal to 0. So I'm multiplying through these other pieces of the polynomial and I'm going to subtract it away to get this one unified polynomial, which I will set equal to 0. So the poles here are minus, two, minus 0 0.2186 and minus 3.9 plus or minus j1.8. So if this doesn't make sense, push pause here and see if you can get this same equation based on your own calculations. Okay, so let's go ahead and label where this is on the root locus. So only minus 0 0.2186 makes sense as a breakaway point. So we've calculated that. Now I'd like to know where are the asymptotes and what are their angles. So the asymptote is the sum of the poles minus the sum of the zeros. This equals minus 4. So we have a value at minus 1, minus 2, skip a few, and minus 4 is sigma a. So that's our asymptote, and the asymptote angles are plus and minus 90 degrees. So we're going to end up with a root locus that looks a little bit like this. So we know there exists some k such that there are no closed loop poles in the right hand plane. As long as we have a disturbance equal to zero, we'll be stable. So let's go ahead and find some k that's around this point. So this is around s plus or equals minus 2 plus or minus j 1.2. So in order to do this, again, we're going to multiply through and get our closed loop transfer function. 1 plus k times g o l of s is equal to 0, equals 1 plus k times those pole values as we multiply them through. So we have a little bit of algebra to do here. So 
So we multiply the denominator through, put all the pieces together, and now we're going to end up with, again, some k minus 1 times s plus 2k minus 10 equals to 0. And so we know the place where we'd like for the poles to be. We're just going to pick some values of k and see how close we can get. So here, this doesn't really make sense. I need more k-bell. So k equals to 10. Let's see what my pole values are here. So here we get s equals minus 0 0.43 plus or minus j1. So that's not quite right. At k equals 20. Now we get s equals 0 point, minus 0 0.94 plus or minus j1.67. So that's actually close enough. I think I wanted it to be about minus 1 plus or minus j2. Uh, and so I consider that this is close enough for me. So with k equals to 20, now I'm going to calculate what my, or I already, actually already know because I did the calculation there, what my uh, characteristic equation will be. So this gives the stability properties of the system. So let's look now at how the disturbance impacts the system's overall transfer function. So this is the transfer function based on the previous example. So after we multiply GC times G, this is the numerator, and then here we have the denominator, times R, plus, we're going to do the same thing, except here we're going to have the original transfer function G, which is 20 over S plus 10, or sorry, 20 over S plus 1, S minus 1. And you can see where the k shows up here. We don't have the k in the numerator uh, because the gain k only affects the characteristic equation. So we don't see that gain k based on the fact that in the transfer function, k only shows up when we're multiplying by gc. It doesn't show up when we're multiplying into the regular plant. Okay, so now we have some simplifying to do. And after we do that, we see that we get y is equal to 20 times quantity s plus 2 over our characteristic equation times the reference input plus s plus 10 over our characteristic equation times our disturbance. So we can break these two pieces down into the input response. So this is the response based on our input r. And then we also have the disturbance response. So whenever some disturbance shows up into the system, this is how we react to that disturbance. So a few points here. One, both of these responses have the same characteristic equation. So if the characteristic equation indicates stability, then our system is going to be stable. Secondly, the magnitude of the disturbance response is smaller than the input response. So this is actually good. If, we, if our input is generally larger than the disturbance, then we're mainly going to be responding to the input. If the disturbance is much larger than the input, then we may be reacting more to the disturbance. But most importantly, the system is bivostable. So again, in the previous example, when we were talking about canceling a pole, what that meant was that we ended up with an unstable pole showing up still at the disturbance, and that's because the controller and the plant had a zero and a pole that canceled one another. So that's what brought about the instability was that zero pole cancellation.